Perfect. Uh, hi, everybody. You might have to excuse me if I start coughing or something. I'm getting over a kind of bad cold. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about hashes and the crypto sponge. Uh, a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Kylan Stewart. I am the White Hat Publicity Officer. So I know it's second quarter, but if you haven't joined the Facebook group, you definitely should. Um, I am currently pursuing two bachelor's degrees in computer science and math. So if this talk seems a little bit math heavy to you, that's kind of why. Also, because math is cool and CS is math. So just like be advised. Um, I'm also not a doctoral candidate. And I am also not a full time crypto researcher. Uh, this is just something cool that is cool and I thought you guys should know about. Uh, so this is where we're headed. Today, we are headed to sponge functions. This is what they look like, like a diagram of them. This is not like what actual sponge functions. You're not going to find this in the wild growing on a tree. <laughs> uh, this is just kind of what they look like. But I don't expect you to know any of this right now, because we haven't talked about it yet. So uh, everyone else is also sort of building to this. We'll see how it goes in the future. Uh, so another thing I want to mention before we jump in is crypto equals math does not equal Bitcoin. Uh, one thing I found in researching this talk is when I Google crypto, now it comes up as like Bitcoins and not as like cryptography. And I thought that was annoying. And I thought that more of us could research crypto and that would change it. Yay, search engine optimization. So people like secrets, right? Like everybody likes to have a couple secrets in their life. I'm sure everybody does. Uh, this is a cryptography talk. So if I didn't mention the Caesar cipher, I think something would be amiss. So you take all the letters and you shift them over a little bit, and then you got yourself a Caesar cipher. Congratulations. Uh, you know, a cool lady named Hedy Lamar created a technology in World War II using radio frequency waves that uh, established secure connections and is sort of the basis for what we have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi now, which is really cool. And uh, in general, people just like to have secrets. A lot of people have them. A lot of people you know, uh, like to keep them secret. But not everybody, uh, because some secrets are worth sharing, but secretly. This is one of my favorite quotes about uh, security is, it is no secret that the best thing about secrets is secretly telling somebody your secret, thereby adding another secret to your collection of secrets secretly. And obviously, uh, this quote was by none other than the prolific SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, and I think that it actually describes crypto really well is because uh, you know, you have a secret and you want somebody else to know that secret, but you don't want anybody who isn't that person to know that secret. And so you need to tell it to them, but secretly. So that's sort of the basis of crypto in the first place. Um, will this work? Can I, yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. So this is why we have crypto. It's kind of how we keep our secrets safe from the outside world. Uh, you know, if you encrypt, if you send an email, other people might be able to, you know, get that email, read it, and then like say it to other people who you might not want to know what's in that email. Uh, but if you encrypt an email, then nobody else can read that email because you encrypted it as long as you use like good encryption. So, let's talk about some definitions. So the first definition I'm going to talk to you about is hash functions. So hash functions are these really cool functions that take some input and give you some output, just like any other function. Uh, cryptographic hash functions want to have some really useful properties. For example, every time you give it an input, uh, it will give you the same output. So if I give you the string hello, and I give you the string hello again, and you encrypt it twice, you should come out with the same garbage both times, uh, because it should look like garbage in the end. Uh, another property that it should have is it should be relatively fast for a computer to do. You don't want to try to encrypt something on the fly. Uh, so you could send like a secret quick military message that might be time sensitive. You don't want that to take a year to encrypt. That would be ridiculous. Uh, it has to be hard to find the message from the output. So uh, if I hand you some garbage encrypted stuff, you shouldn't be able to do some magic without knowing anything and come out with the, uh, the message that I sent, which might be like, hello. Uh, another thing is, uh, or that should be hard to do. And various definitions of hard uh, could be like, should take two to the 80 time, which is close enough to random. Or uh, another way to think about it could be 
uh, it should be as fast as just randomly guessing messages and hashing them and seeing if they come out to be the same. Um, f of uh, adding one thing to a message should make the outputs be very different. Uh, so if you, add, if you had the string hello and you put hello and then the number one at the end, those two hashes should be totally different. You shouldn't be able to see like, oh, we just added a one to the end of the string and that's how we got uh, the change. Uh, that should be very different. So like, you know, if you had the string peanut butter, it should be really diff the hash of peanut butter should be very different from like the hash of peanut butter if you like switch the, switch the first letter. It should be really different, so you shouldn't be able to tell. And then uh, the last thing is that, again, it's hard to find uh, two things that hash to the same thing. So you shouldn't find hello and, you know, a cat picture and you take the hash of both those things and it's the same exact thing. That's not what you want. Um, that, of course, happens because uh, there's an infinite amount of different messages that you could send and computers only have finite space. Uh, so there's a thing in math called the pigeonhole principle and that makes it really hard to actually like, get an infinite amount of things into like, a finite space. That's not something you can actually do. Uh, the next definition is a stream cipher. So a stream cipher uh, is a cipher that is created by encrypting each element of the message with a key from a stream normally. Uh, and the last one is SHA, which is the family of secure hash algorithms. And like some of them are secure. <laughs> at some point, we thought the other but at some point, we thought the other ones were secure, and then it turns out like, oh, no, they're not. Uh, but you know, that's why we make more. So with that, uh, some other features that would be cool to have is uh, you can't have backdoors for P and Q. So a lot of uh, cryptographic functions <laughs> use these things called P and Q that are these big primes. And uh, there is a whole thing where in some uh, hash functions, you'd be able to pick a P and a Q such that you'd be able to easily decrypt a message. So it was like a weird mathematical backdoor. It's a really cool concept, but like also don't have those because they're bad. Um, and then it should also behave like a random oracle. And basically, it should just seem totally random and like complete garbage. All of the output is that, that's what that should be. Uh, and hopefully, that's what you get. Um, yeah, a random oracle responds to every unique query. So like hello versus hello one, with a truly random response chosen uniformly from its output. So any output that it could have, it just picks a random one, and it gives you that one. But every time you give it one, it gives you the same one. And uh, that's, a, that's a random oracle. That's what we hope all cryptographic functions behave like. Awesome. OK. So here's some small problems. Also, please feel free to stop me anytime if you have any questions. I know this might not be the stuff that you normally study in security or in your computer science classes or in your math classes. That's totally fine. Uh, please stop me if you have questions. So here's some small problems. First, uh, computers have finite memory, so we run into some problems with the pigeonhole principle, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's one problem that we have to solve or at least mitigate. Um, if any of you remember shattered Google's paper from a while ago, uh, they found a concrete example of finding two things that hash to the same thing in SHA-1. Uh, and that was bad, but we already knew SHA-1 was broken, so it's fine. Uh, not that anybody still implements it or anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, again, the writing on the wall was, uh, the writing was on the wall for SHA-1 for some time. So NIST, which is a department of the US government, which handles uh, various cryptographic um, standards, they said that we have to have a competition to get a new algorithm that is uh, different from what we have now and also not made by the NSA because people don't like that. Yeah? What were the two things that hashed the same thing? You can see it on their website, shattered.io, but uh, when you look at them like a human, it just looks like a, red, a PDF with some red and a PDF with some blue, and then it just like the hash is the same and it, it's like bad. Uh, so, yeah, those are the two things. IT. It's definitely shattered.io. Yeah, it might have changed. I don't know, uh, but like. I think he actually bought both of them. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions before we proceed with 
like actual sponge functions, finally. Cool. So uh, onwards to the sponge functions. <laughs> so sponge functions have two main parts. Uh, they have the absorbing phase and the squeezing phase. And so we're going to go through each of those individually. Uh, I'm going to cover some of the other things in sponge functions that, you'll see, that you saw like in the graph from earlier. And then, uh, yeah, we'll let the math begin. So uh, we have the input. So uh, from the website, uh, the Kekak website, which is the team that came up with this uh, sponge function, and they are the people, who, it's like the cryptographic primitive is what it's called, from which the sponge functions have grown and proliferated, prol proliferated and turned into SHA-3. I'm, I'm super sick, I'm sorry. So from the in, first, the input string is padded with a reversible padding rule and cut into blocks of R bits. Then the B bits of state, which you can kind of see somewhere in there. Uh, uh, sorry, the first R bits of the state are interleaved with the applications of B of uh, sorry, f, uh, which is the function. <laughs> I don't know why I like the letter b. It's not in here. Uh, <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, and then the first certain amount of bits from the state, so b, are initialized to 0, and the sponge construction proceeds in two phases. So that's the input, which is just the m part that's going into the pad. Uh, so I'm going to repeat that, because I definitely said it wrong. Uh, first, the input string is padded with a reversible padding rule and cut into blocks of R bits. Then B bits of the state are initialized to zero, and the sponge construction proceeds in two phases. So uh, the input phase is basically the message is put together with the pad um, as a very high level thing. Yeah? Is there any relationship between the quantities of B and R? Are they equal or are they greater than one? Um, I believe that uh, it depends on your application. Uh, a lot of sponge construction is like, these specifics depend on your application of the sponge construction because it's meant to sort of be applied in many different ways. And so depending on if you're writing like a hash function versus like a different thing. So the exact number of bits you use in different parts of this are parameters that they tweaked in order to find a function that provided cryptographic hash uh, yeah. properties. Yeah. And so like the sponge is like a general more broad thing than just a hash function. Any, hash, any yeah. function is a hash function. Yeah. Security, you have to have the right numbers for R and C. Yeah. So like it has a lot of different applications. So depending on the parameters that you pick, you'll get different things that you might want. For example, a cryptographic hash, hash function and like a bunch of other random stuff. Um, so that's the input. Does anyone have any more questions? I'm not going into the specifics of like, you know, B bits and like this is all this random stuff, but like Basically, the message is put together with a pad. Yeah? Yeah. Wait, so when you say the state, it's just the output of f on past iteration, like past blocks of the message, or is there some other state somewhere that I don't see? So uh, we haven't gotten to f yet. That was I misspoke in the beginning. Um, okay. I was on the next slide when I should have been on this slide. Um, and so for now, the state is just like the message r and c. Yeah. OK, cool. So we're going to talk about absorbing. So in the absorbing phase, the R bit input blocks that we talked about earlier, uh, they are XORed into the first R bits of state and then interleaved with applications of F. Right? So you can see how it, there's like this weird symbol with the arrows, and it's like a plus sign in a circle. Uh, that's an XOR. I'll, get, I'll explain that on the whiteboard in a second. Yeah, there's a pen here. Cool. Um, and then they are put into F, and then they do it again, and then they put it into F, and then they keep doing that. Um, and then when all the input blocks are processed, the sponge will switch to the squeezing phase. So uh, first, I'm going to explain who doesn't know what an XOR is. OK, cool. So a fair number of you. So has everyone seen or understand the concept of a truth table? OK, cool. They're like pretty easy. Uh, if you have P and you have q, and p is true, true, false, false, and q is true, false, true, false, but false, Thomas. So uh, these are just all the options you can have for p and q. And then if you XOR them, 
P auxiliary Q. Uh, it's true uh, if and only if V. Yeah? Oh, sorry. Wait, no, go for it. I was just going to say P and Q in this, in this uh, example are statements that could be true or false. Yeah, P and Q are statements that could be true or false. And uh, XOR is true if and only if uh, they're in opposite states. So one is true and the other is false, and the other one's, it's, or yeah. So in this case, it would be true, true, false because they're both false, or false because they're both true. Does everyone agree with me that knows what an XOR is? Cool. All right. I just want to make sure. I'm a little fuzzy. So uh, this is what an XOR means. Uh, basically, the same thing can be applied to bits where, you know, like one is true and zero is false, and then you kind of just like, you take the message of bits and then you like put it in with uh, the R and the C that you're using here, which is just like the state stuff, uh, and then you XOR them. Yeah. Can you show us how you apply it to bits? Yeah. So, uh, Specifically more than yeah. Bits, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can. So uh, let's say you have one, zero, one, one, zero, one, for example. Uh, and you have another one that's like zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, right? And you want to XOR these. Huh? Yeah, OK. So you see these two are different. So like you're going to XOR these. These two are different, so you put a one. These two are the same, so you put a zero. These two are the same, so you put a zero. These two are different, so you put a one. Zero. Zero. So this would be XORing two strings of bits, two bit strings, if you will. Everyone cool with XOR? So this is kind of like one of those functions that you see a lot in cryptography because it has some cool properties of being like, oh, well, were they both zero or were they both one? I don't really know. Or were they both, you know, which, what thing were they, right? And we don't know. It's hard to find. Uh, but like when mixed with other functions and different things, you can create some really cool cryptographic functions. So that's the absorbing phase. Basically, you take a certain amount of the message, and you take a certain amount of the initial conditions, R and C, and you put them together with this weird XOR thing, and then you send them through an F that you pick, depending on uh, the application that you're looking for in your sponge function. And then you do it again until you're done with the message, and then you move on to the squeezing phase. Cool? Nice. OK, so in the squeezing phase, the first R bits of the state are returned as output blocks. And then they're interleaved with the applications of the function f. The number of output blocks is chosen by the user, which is cool because it means they're arbitrary. And so it means that now we have this cool function with an arbitrary input length and output length, which is fun. Um, so yeah, you can sort of see that they just take some out uh, and then they put it in the end, and then you do F again, and then you take some out and you put it in the end, and you keep going until you're happy with the output like block length. Does that make sense for the sort of squeezing phase? So what we did is we took some input, we interleaved it with F, and we like grew this sponge, and it like absorbed all the information. And now we're doing the same thing, but in like not even reverse, we're just doing F again. But in this case, F is squeezing out blocks. Yeah. So is the input getting, after you pass the absorbing squeezing boundary, is the input to each f getting smaller each time? Like I don't think so, no. Okay. Uh, so I think that's what c is for, right? Uh, so f permutes the entire state, including r. Yeah. So the, the state gets permuted, and you switch to squeeze, and you pull out the first r bit. Yeah. And then you permute the state again to pull out another fresh r bit. Oh, yeah. sweet. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what's going on. Um, yeah. Any questions on squeezing? OK, cool. So uh, the output, like most cryptographic functions, uh, should look like weird garbage uh, to anybody who doesn't know uh, how to go back. And going back is a kind of different thing that I'm not going into in this talk. but. Uh, I think they're reversible, yeah. They're definitely reversible, right? I did not know of reversible. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, 
it's one of those things where it should be hard, uh, but I am pretty sure that if you pick the correct F and beginning conditions, uh, you will be able to have a reversible sponge function um, if you pick a good enough F. But then it calls into question like, oh, is it still secure enough to be used as a cryptographic hash function? Uh, which is a very good question. Um, yeah, so like, <laughs> what is all of the other like stuff that's in this thing? Like, there's this weird R, there's a weird C, and so it's kind of a lot of math. And a lot of that math sort of depends on what you want out of this function, right? Like, if you want it to be a cryptographic hash function, it'll be very different than if you just wanted like a regular hash function. Because a regular hash function doesn't necessarily have those cool properties that we said before. Um, and it's a lot of math. Uh, like the padding rule is this weird thing. Uh, and you probably shouldn't know what that is. And I'm definitely not going to get into it in this talk. Uh, if you want to know, you should definitely like look it up because there's a white paper that's cool and out there and where I found it because it's the people who wrote sponge functions. Um, and then the last C bits are never directly affected by the input blocks and never output during the squeezing phase. Yeah. So this construction that we've talked about is irreversible, but if you change yeah. the construction and permute it in different the ways. Duplex the duplex construction. construction. Yeah. Yeah, there's a different kind of sponge function, like construction of the sponge function called the duplex construction, and that one is reversible. But I'm not getting into the duplex one because I thought that would be too much, and I just kind of wanted to explain this cool thing. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, there's. There are reversible ones. This particular one is irreversible. Uh, so yeah. Um, and then also like how to pick F. Because up until now, I've just said like F is this magic black box that does some cool stuff. And uh, each implementation of a sponge function has its own F. Uh, and each application that you might want from it has its own F as well. So it, in this diagram, is pretty much just a magic black box that does some cool stuff. Uh, but if you wanted to actually like read into what is the F that SHA-3 uses, you could definitely like find that because crypto is cool and like it's open because it sort of needs to be. Uh, what is all this other stuff? It's a lot of math. It's a lot of math that is unfortunately out of the scope of this talk uh, because I'm not going to go through like every single application of the sponge function and the duplex construction and what F each of those uses, and what R, and what C, and which one optimizes for what, and all that fun stuff, because it's kind of a lot to try to go through in one talk. Uh, that's really sad for me, because I love math. Uh, but if you guys want to look it up, you definitely should. Um, I have a slide full of links later on uh, that has a lot of really cool resources. So if you do want to look into that, um, it'll be up uh, at the end. So uh, let's take a recap of where we are uh, not necessarily in the talk, but just like in the world in general. And also now would be a great time for questions as we take like a tiny little like step back from the interesting sponge stuff. Uh, so SHA-3 is kind of the reason why we're talking about sponge functions. Uh, it's the application for which they are most known. Um, and it's because this team of people called uh, the people who work on Kekak, uh, they, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. Yeah, it's like. If they wanted it to be pronounceable, they chose a different name. Yeah, there's a bunch of <laughs> there's a bunch of K's and C's in their name, and I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. And there's like an E and an A. I don't know. Whatever. Um, <laughs> there's some cool people. Uh, probably they came up with a cool thing at least. Uh, so SHA-3 is in SHA the family of secure hash functions, some of which are secure. Um, and you can see some of the ones which aren't, or like we know aren't anymore, like SHA-0 and SHA-1 are not secure and should be deprecated. Probably, <laughs> like they probably should be. Uh, they kind of aren't, which is unfortunate. Uh, SHA-2 is sort of what we have been working with. Uh, and NIST, as I mentioned, wanted to find something that was different from SHA-2 because if you have two different hash functions that are totally different, it's much harder to crack both, especially if one of them is not reversible, um, like the sponge construction. Although I think SHA-3 uses the duplex construction. No? No. no. OK, cool. I guess it doesn't. That's also cool. Uh, yeah, so it, uh, it is. It's different from SHA-2. And that's why it's not replacing SHA-2. 
Nobody has said, I want these cool sponge function things to be the only thing that we use from now on. SHA-3 is the only cryptographic thing that we should ever use, because that would be ridiculous. Um, and SHA-2 is also still fine. Like, for the purposes for which it's being used, it's still fine. And so nobody's saying that we should replace it. It's just SHA-3 is this cool, different thing that we have. And some people take issue with some of SHA-2 because some of SHA-2 was designed by the NSA. And some people think the NSA put in cryptographic mathematical backdoors. And that wouldn't be great, right? Uh, we don't want our data encrypted with something that has a backdoor, regardless of who put it there, why it's there. Um, so that's kind of why we have SHA-3 is because some people wanted a thing that was different. And so we got a thing that was different. And it's pretty cool. Um, it's also cool because it can be modified for a bunch of different uses, these cool sponge things. So that's sort of where we are in the world right now. Uh, some, some fun things I want to leave you with uh, from these sponge, these weird sponge things is that math is cool. And math is the basis of a lot of what we do in computer, si computer science, regardless of whether you think so or not. Um, and it's really important to know some of the basics of what is this stuff that runs our computers. Uh, someday, probably, there will be quantum computers in the world that are feasible, maybe. Um, and if that ever happens, then we will probably need a whole new suite of cryptographic functions and a whole new suite of people to make those, because quantum computers break things really fast. Uh, and so it might be worthwhile just to think more about the math that goes into something like Python or something like C, uh, the math behind what makes your computer run. Another thing I want to uh, leave you with is crypto is cool. Crypto is this really cool thing that like you throw some stuff at it, and it throws you a thing back, and then you have a secret. And secrets are fun, right? We all, we all said we liked secrets. Uh, so yeah, everybody loves encryption, right? Like Who doesn't like encryption? So cri crypto is cool. It's something that I think you should look into more if you like that sort of thing. If, you, if any of this talk sounded interesting to you, you should definitely look more into crypto because it's cool and fun. Um, and here's a slide full of links that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I hope that you find it useful. Um, here's the actual slide full of links that I mentioned. Um, yeah, and you can see a lot of them are by like, uh, the first two are by like kekak.team. And uh, that's the team that sort of created this thing. And uh, they have a lot of uh, useful information on there. Uh, I also want to recommend Wikipedia as a useful place to go start looking. Uh, it's a good place to go start looking at your research. Uh, I cite it here mostly because I got a lot of my sources from Wikipedia. Uh, and a lot of the information you find on crypto is relatively useful, um, if not very useful. Like They have some good tables and stuff that you can fact check. Um, and then the last one is, uh, Nate Graf wrote a really cool C implementation of sponge functions for SHA-3. And it's good code, which is, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, and it's cool because Nate is cool. And everybody loves Nate, right? Yeah. So does anybody have any questions or want to read an XKCD? <laughs> So with regards to the, um, uh, so we have sort of this sponge function. Is there some kind of, um, do we, word, do we lose crypt, it, let's say, because we have that big phase where we have a bunch of Fs, and then it looked like it was a smaller phase, but we squeeze it out. If we were to extend that squeezing phase, do we get more, less and less security in our, in our bits? The opposite. Yeah. The opposite. I think the more you do F, the you, better it'll be. You get a longer tag that makes it harder to find the uh, actual digit. Plus, I think extending F will give you a longer output in the most more cases. The more you have, the more you need to yeah. have that particular. You squeeze yeah. out R bits every time there's a function. Yeah. And you tack those on end to end to end to end to get more. The more things you yeah. have, the longer your, uh, your hash. Like between 
yeah. what you were talking about, is that just like appending like the output of f to like your... So remember what we did in the like beginning a, when we had the XOR and we like XORed two messages together to make like one thing that we put into f? Mm -hmm. We're basically taking that much again because it didn't change the length. Yeah. Uh, so we're basically taking that much again and XORing it again into the thing that we just put through f. So we're taking more from the message, that same amount. We're XORing it again, like we did at the beginning. And then we're putting that through f. For I was talking about an end in the sequence. Yeah. When you're getting the stuff out of f, uh -huh. into the output. Yeah. When you say that you're um, interleaving it, I think you said something about like interleaving the output. Um, yeah. Or interleaving the output f. Yeah, it's this one. Yeah. Interleave the application that's going to f. Oh, so that's just it's going to f. So it's sort of like the opposite. OK. Yeah. Because instead of putting it in, you're taking it out, and you're also not XORing it, I don't, I don't think. So yeah, you're kind of doing like a weird different function at the end, right? It's like a floor function of something times a different thing, if I recall correctly. Let me look at my code. Yeah, right? Like it's some, <laughs> weird, it's some weird different thing that you're doing. Uh, but you're not XORing it again, I don't think. So it's sort of like. You take out some, but you sort of don't, and then you like squeeze it to change the state. You put it through F to change the state, and then you like do some more. Yeah. I think that's what, if you see those weird symbols, uh, it's putting it through a function, and then it puts it out to Z. So it puts it into that weird function, and then eventually it all goes back out to Z, is how I think it works. Pretty sure it works. Yeah, Nate's the one with the C implementation, so, yeah. And that F isn't like a Python cipher or anything, that's a completely different F, right? Yeah, so F is just like a function. Okay. And you can pick F based on the different things that you're doing. SHA-3 uses a specific one, uh, and other people who could use it for different things will use a different F because they might not want it to use the same one as SHA-3, yeah. It seems like you would, for cryptographic purposes, want F to just like mix stuff around a lot. Yeah. So like you put some stuff in, Yeah, that's basically the concept of F. Yeah. What is a Feistel? <laughs> a Feistel? Um, a Feistel block is um, it's a thing in DES. So the old cryptographic system from the 70s that's also denotated as a block with an F in it, which is why I thought of it. Um, but it's just it was it was a basic primitive in 70s cryptography. It has um, all the same shapes, but the arrows point different places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we reuse the same like six letters in crypto, but the arrows being different tell you that this is modern. Well, but crypto. like the the things are different, right? Like yeah, no, 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 they're it, totally different. You, you use the same twenty six letters in the English alphabet. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they like swap around the order and stuff, and then it makes a different thing. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are like, is this really secure? Because you use the same F for the absorbing and the squeezing phase. And that's something that a lot of people don't like about it, is that you use the same function uh, th for the whole thing. Uh, instead of just like, you use one for absorbing, and then you use one for squeezing. Or even better, you use a different function every time, which would be so ridiculous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and would require you knowing in advance how many times you need to XOR stuff in, and then how many times you want to like bring stuff out to make a longer output block. And yeah, so that would be a whole different thing. And, uh, but some people don't like it, if you want to know why some people don't like this thing. Yeah, yeah but SHA-2 is still, still good for now. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? In the, uh, in the page where it showed all like, the different operations for the different SHA implementations, what is the ROT operation? I think that's what it said. Was it like ROT? ROT, yeah. It's like rotate, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's basically like, remember when I said it Caesar cipher? Matter. Yeah, uh, and you kind of just like take the letters and then you like shift them over. It's like a rotate, okay. and you like wrap them around. So like, yeah, and like you can do it different ways. So you could sort of like, let's say you had a deck of cards and you cut it and you like did that. You could do that. There's like a bunch of different ways, but in general it's just rotate. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, so like, if you were doing a Caesar cipher and you did like, if, and you saw something like ROT1, it would mean that the letters were rotated once. Yeah, so a lot of people use like ROT13, and it means that you shifted it 13 times over. So I haven't done Caesar cipher enough to uh, memorize ROT13, but we could. Yeah? Uh, some people are. Uh, I, can't, I couldn't give you any concrete examples of people using SHA-3 off the top of my head. Uh, but like, there are definitely some people using it. Uh, I mean, Nate Graf could show you a nice C implementation. I have no idea who's using it. Yeah. I mean, like, there's got to be people using it, right? I'm not like a cipher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I, there's got to be a concrete example somewhere. Yeah. I'm going to write like, an internet of things. Should I use I mean, you should probably just use whatever you think is best, but use SHA-2 or SHA-3. Like, probably use SHA-2, yeah. Well, so the, one of the, the, what makes SHA-3 special is that the output is arbitrarily <coughs> accepted. Because all other hash functions we've ever created have a finite output. Um, and so what SHA-3 allows you to do is implement the F block in fast hardware in an embedded device and reuse that F block Potentially to create arbitrarily longer outputs. So if you make it really easy to do an F block, then you can later come back and say, oh, do that twice instead of only doing it once to get more output. Um, yeah. So you could future proof your hardware by implementing that in an embedded chip. Is that mostly just useful for future proofing, like doubling the size of the hash? Is that useful? Yeah, so actually, that's, that's like the arbitrarily large. Uh, arbitrarily large. Yeah. How arbitrarily large? Like arbitrarily large. <laughs> the, the point of this is that, yeah, you can just specify, like, like let's say you have this giant memory, like 2 to the 80,000 or something ridiculous like that, and you want, like, 2 to the 79 million, something less than 80,000. Uh, 79,000, for example. Uh, yeah, 79,000 is not less than 80,000. It definitely. <laughs> okay, so you could be like, I, I want the output to be that big, and it'll just do that. It'll just go as many times as you need it to go uh, in order to make that happen. And you could also send it arbitrarily big inputs uh, as long as it has like enough memory. Yeah, you and then you, because you raise your hand first. Does this mean that? SHA-3 does not suffer from like the birthday problem or pigeonhole principle stuff if you can make the ar it arbitrarily big? I think it still suffers from the pigeonhole principle because while you can make it arbitrarily big, computers still do not have infinite memory. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stupid Wait, so let's say you don't actually care how big, you don't care about hiding the length of the input thing, and you're okay to Grow the SHA or the, the, the hash to be exactly as large as the padded input? Well, I mean, you just make it the rest of the stuff bigger. So then you end up with <coughs> an output space which is as large as the input space. Output space which is as large as the input space. It doesn't matter how big your inputs or your outputs are. You can make the output space larger or smaller than your input yeah, space. But then you don't have pigeonholes. Well, I mean. No, you just have a very bad encryption function. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, like, your input space is all things that can be encrypted. So you still have the problem. Why, yeah, why do you have that? In realistic terms, you probably suffer from the birthday, or from the pigeonhole principle. But theoretically, you don't. Jasper had a question. Um, so I, I saw my question was just that when you find that there are flaws in most hash functions, you usually don't find them like they're like totally reversibly get a property wrong, which is what it would be to reduce the collision space such that it's not crashing. That's not security more. Right? I can find collisions yeah. pretty easily. It so happened in V5, so happened in V1. Is the idea that I can, unless I find some weird fundamental flaw with like F, that I can say, oh, someone found a reduction that makes it easier on SHA-3, I can just run, I can take all my SHA-3 implementations and say, hey, run twice as long now, and just kind of overcome that Wait, so what? by growing the output space. So your question is by growing the output space? Like let's say that I have 80 bits of output. Right. Yeah. The idea is it should be better than one out of two D, or it should be about one out of two D eighty. Should be how hard it should be to like find a collision. And the idea is I find a collision like two to the forty. So I just now like say like, all right, well eighty bits is equivalent to two to the forty, so I just go like one hundred sixty bits and we're chilling again. Or is that the idea of having that, that core output that's future? 
the neighbor country too, because there's such yeah. 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 extend the output to like tack on over any weakness I find? I think output is one of those things that you specify. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So you can make the output long. Yeah. I guess that was the question. So, uh, like, I guess uh, is there any research in any theoretical attack that would mitigate using that? So the the, yeah. the other problem is the FWAP has been attacked to, uh, for reducing rack. So inside the FWAP, you apply this permutation 24 times. Um, and so they've attacked reduced round FWAP and have found a vulnerability. So there there are two ways things you can do. One is you can tack on more FWAP. Two is you could have more permutation inside the FWAP. Yeah. yeah. If you if you if you got to a collision though, that means that when you were squeezing, the state became the same as some different input, right? So like two of two of them absorbed, and then in squeezing, they, they became the same thing. It starts to oh, the same. Two got the same. So if you just kept not squeezing, they would just keep becoming. Not necessarily same. because you have those C bits, which you know, for. But if you know, three or four rounds might not affect it, but then maybe on the fifth round, those C bits that you never see. Those were in the close well, to zero exposure. Those were, but well, I think we're in the squeezing in the squeezing phase, it's deterministic, right? If you have yeah. one squeeze is something, then it's going to be the. If you just yes, but you're only seeing part yeah. of the input. Let's say you're only taking the first two bits out of you know, eighty bits of data. So you have those seventy-eight bits of data that you can't see. So the first two bits might be the same for a really, really long time, but those 78 bits of data. Yeah. yeah. So, so see how, how you have that C? I see. That go, that I mean, we're talking about past the absorbing to another yeah. point. Yeah. Past yeah. that point, the outputs, are, we're saying that as we squeeze, if we have to do if two different messages, by the time we get to the, absor the squeezing phase, that after a couple rounds of squeezing, end up with the same output of F. From there on out, repeated applications of that will match with those two extra points. Not forever. necessarily. Okay, if you actually <laughs> get to that lot, if yeah, you get to that's that what line, we're describing. Yes. and the whole state is the same, then yes. That's, yes. That's but just because yes. you get to, uh, to no, output, I agree, I agree that that doesn't we're describing that. past that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> we're not arguing that. Yes. But actually finding a way to attack that dot line is probably. Okay, I guess. But that's the attack. I didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah. And if, if you have a good attack against SHA-3, like. I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping that stuff to myself. Yeah, like if you do, go <laughs> for it. Currency, but... these are SHA-3. <laughs> 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 he just needs a master's thesis that's more important than the <laughs> 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 it happens. Cool. All right.